Okay, great. Um, welcome to the uh, licensing committee for the Board of Behavioral Sciences uh, for the November 19th, 2021 meeting. Uh, my name is Wendy Strack. I'm the chairperson of the committee. And before we convene, I'd like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing the board's laws where, where public protection of the public it's inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted. The protection of the public shall be paramount. The meeting today is being conducted consistent with the provisions of government code section 11133. I will announce when we're accepting public comment on the various issues and the meeting moderator will open the lines as appropriate. Each commenter will have two minutes to comment. If you do not have a chance to make public comment today, all recommendations today will be heard and up for public comment at the next full board meeting. Uh, moderator, would you please provide the audience instructions on how they may participate during the appropriate times? Yes, when we open for public comment, I will flash this slide on the screen. And to make a public comment, you will follow the st steps. You'll click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of right corner of your screen. Ask in the ask field type comment and click send. When prompted, you will click the unmute me button to make your comment. Uh, conversely, um, you can also click raise hand icon on next to your name. And that, that's for audio only by oh, audio only participants can raise hand by pressing star three. You will be given two minutes to comment. And at 15 seconds left, I will notify you that you have 15 seconds left. Thank you, moderator. Um, I'd now like to call the meeting to order and um, ask Christina to call the roll to establish a quorum. Wendy Strack. Uh, present, public member. Diana Herwick. Present, professional me member. We have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, before we begin, I want to remind all speakers to remain on topic when making comments on agenda items. And our first agenda item is discussion and possible approval of the June 25th, 2021 co committee meeting minutes. Um, does anyone uh, wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? No, seeing none. Um, Diana, would you like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar? Yep, I make a motion to approve the consent calendar from June 25th, 2021. And I will uh, second that motion. Uh, Christina, please take the vote. Diana Herwick? Yes. Wendy Schrock? I'm sorry, yeah. this is Board uh, uh, Council Joseph Chin. Um, if the board is going to vote, we should open for public comment on each agenda item. Oh. Thank you very much. This is um, my first meeting as chair, so I appreciate the um, reminder on that. Um, moderator, are there any comments from the public? Okay, I will open up to make public comments. You can click on the Q&A panel as soon as I open it um, and click comment. I'm sorry, Shelly, can you remind me where I open that up? Yes, so if you go up under um, up under event at the top of your screen, then click on options, it'll open a window okay. and there's a checkbox in there for the Q&A and you'll have to hit apply after you check it. Okay, I have opened up the Q&A panel. If you have a, a question or if you wanna comment, please type comment into the field and when prompted, I uh, will unmute you or raise your hand if you're audio only. We'll give it a few moments. I see no comments or hands raised. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, moderator. Okay. Thank you. Um, seeing no public comments, Christina, can you now take the vote again, please? Thank you. Okay. Diana Herwick. Yes. Wendy Strack. Yes. Motion carries. 
Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, the next item on the agenda um, is overview and purpose of the committee. Uh, Roseanne, would you like to provide us with the overview? Yes, thanks, Wendy. So this is just sort of a, a recap of how things have been going with this committee. Uh, we last met on June 25th. Uh, this committee was established to conduct an in-depth discussion about several topics related to the licensing process. So on June 25th, the committee had discussed removing the requirement that regis renewing registrants with a failing California law and ethics score complete a 12 hour law and ethics course. Instead, the committee recommended that that requirement be deleted and replaced with a three hour California law and ethics course requirement for all renewing registrants. So, so that proposal that came out of this committee went on to the policy and advocacy committee and ultimately the full board and the board did direct staff to pursue a legislative proposal for that this coming year. So that's one thing that this um, that has moved on from this committee. So there's several other sort of interrelated topics to be discussed and we've kind of made a list so that the committee can keep track and know what topics um, are still on the table and add or delete any that they feel is appropriate. Um, some things like the allowable age of a passing California law and ethics to score because the, there's currently not a, a expiration date on the age of that exam. Um, number of exam attempts, whether or not that should be limited, um, and a few other things that you can see li listed here. So don't know if there's going to be a lot of comment on this or not, but I'll open it up for the board members to discuss now. I don't think I have any um, comments or questions at this time. Diana, do you have? No, I don't have any questions. Great. Uh, do we need to open this for public comment or? Uh, um, yes, uh, each each item. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, moderator, would you like to uh, open the Q&A panel for public comment? Yes, I have opened the Q&A panel for public comment. Again, if you'd like to make a public comment, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of the screen, type in comment, click send. When prompted to unmute, you will unmute yourself. If you're on audio only, you can use the star three on your phone, or you can also click on the raise hand icon next to your name. And I do have, like I have a comment from Jennifer Alley. Moment, Jennifer, while I unmute you. Okay, I've sent the request. You'll have two minutes. Hello, this is Jennifer Alley with Camp. I'm not 100% sure if this is the appropriate time to say this, but um, or if this would be better to be under items not on the agenda for the committee to discuss later. But we would like to have um, the committee uh, have a discussion about um, life coaches and the work of life coaches in professional corporations. And if there's any um, thoughts or concerns or issues that the board might want to review with that group. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other comments or hands raised. I would, would you like me to close the panel at this time? The Q and A. Yes, please. Thank you. Welcome. Seeing no other um, public comments, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is the the correct agenda item for, to address uh, the concerns raised by camp, but I do believe this is something that has been raised um, both at the in the board meeting setting and at other committees. So I do believe that is a topic that the board intends to discuss at some point. I'm not entirely certain. Steve, I don't know if there's anything in particular to share. No. Nothing particular, but yes, it is on the radar. Okay, definitely. Thank you. Um, with that, I don't think we need a vote or a motion on this one. Okay, so thank you, Roseanne. Another excellent presentation as always. Um, so our next item on the agenda is a discussion and possible recommendation regarding the 6 year limit on experience hours and associate registrations. Um, Roseanne, we'll turn it over to you. 
All right. So, yes, this is our big agenda item uh, topic of discussion today. So um, it is a discussion of the two six year rules that the board has. Um, there are two of them for our applicants. Number one is the age of experience hours. In our law, it requires that hours of supervised experience for LMFT, LPCC, and LCSW licensure must be completed in the six year period prior to submitting an application for license. So basically, when you submit for clinical exam eligibility, um, we look at your hours and they have to be um, no more than six years old. There's one exception to this uh, for LMFT applicants. They can count 500 hours of clinical experience gained in practicum as a trainee with no age limit. Um, MFT trainees are the only pre licensed types that are allowed to count pre degree hours. So that's one of the six year rules. The other six year rule has to do with the length of the registration number. An associate registration can be renewed up to five times. So it can be held for a total of six total years. If the supervised experience hasn't been completed by then, a new registration can be obtained, but the person needs to pass the California Law and Ethics exam before they can get another number. And also with a subsequent registration number, the law does not allow work in a private practice setting, and there's no exceptions to this. So that's for LMFT, LPCC, and LCSW law. LEP law also has a similar limitation, although their law is structured a little bit differently. Um, LEPs don't register with the board uh, to gain experience. The law does require LEPs to have two years of experience before licensure, and the experience, um, the law just simply says the experience must be no more than six years old at the time that they apply. So the rationale behind these limits in the past um, has been that it to ensure that um, applicants for a license have recent relevant experience. Um, you know, if somebody is has experience that's super, super old, say 10 or 20 years, there's a question if, if they are um, in tune with the most recent practice of the profession. It also it kind of serves as an incentive to ensure somebody keeps progressing through the licensing process. Um, that's the main reason that we've kind of believed that why the private practice um, portion has put in, been put in for the second registration number is that the thought is it kind of ensures somebody's going to progress through the licensing process. Uh, based on the information available and kind of looking back and doing a little research, it looks like that both LMFT and LCSW programs, as far as we can tell, have always limited the length of the registrations and um, initially to five years. And then in the late 1980s, it was increased to six years. It's a little bit of background on those six year rules. Um, the committee, um, well, not this particular committee, but the board's committees over the years, at least over my time here, we seem to talk about this, these two six year rules every few years. Um, the most recent, the most recent time we did that was in 2018, but I've been here about 10 years and we've talked about it probably three or four times now. Um, so we've considered certain options in the past. Um, back in 2017, we talked about allowing exceptions to the six year rules to certain applicants due to specific circumstances, such as military service, being a primary caregiver or disability. Um, however, that that topic wasn't really, or that solution wasn't really pursued. There's some sort of questions that arise about, about, you know, how to define exactly what qualifies as a hardship versus something else and how to apply that consistently across um, in individuals, unique experiences, uh, things like that. So um, another thing that the committee has previously discussed is extending one or both of the six year limits to a longer period of time, such as seven or eight years. Um, abolishing the work setting limits of a subsequent registration number, so the private practice piece, um, but implementing stricter requirements to obtain a subsequent registration number. Um, and then the, the thing that last time the committee ultimately decided to do is taking a look at the other law changes that were kind of being made at the time, determine if, if upcoming law changes meant to streamline the licensure process have any effect on cutting time to licensure. So some of the more recent legislation that, that we have run um, is, is still kind of, it's, some of it's been in effect a couple of years now, so we should be starting to see if it's gonna have an effect. 
although it's, it's kind of phasing in because the people that are newer in the licensing process are just getting the benefits of the new law changes. Um, we eliminated in 2016 what we call the buckets for new applicants, where there was a, a large number of uh, buckets of experience hours in very specific content areas where there were minimums or maximum as, uh, in those in those areas that were required to be gained for licensure. So an example would be that you previously could only have 375 hours of telehealth practice, um, things like that. So those went away and we had a new streamlined process come in in 2016 where basically you just have to have a certain number of clinical and a certain number of non-clinical hours. And there's not all these other categories you need to fulfill. We also decreased the required experience hours for LCSW applicants in 2019 from 3,200 hours to 3,000 hours. And in 2019, we allowed triadic supervision in lieu of individual supervision. So um, two supervisees per supervisor instead of one. So these changes were designed to increase the applicant's ability to gain experience hours while preserving public protection safeguards, such as ensuring quality supervision and current and well relevant experience. Um, we had another bill that just passed, AB 690, um, will become effective this coming January 1st. Um, AB 690 also takes some steps that will hopefully increase access to supervision. Um, it allows private practices and professional corporations to utilize contract supervisors instead of um, being those settings being required to utilize employees for supervision. Um, and it also increases the allowable number of supervisees per supervisor in a non exempt setting from 3 to 6. So it remains to be seen what kind of effect, if any, that will have on the length of time to, to licensure. We did a little bit of research um, carried over from last time on. Um, number of people on a subsequent registration number and also time to licensure. Um, attachment A shows the number of applicants that are currently on a subsequent registration number. So it ranges, it, it hovers around 10 to 15 um, percent of the registrants are on a subsequent registration number. Um, for APCCs, you'll see that's a little bit lower. That's our newest license type. So we're just kind of starting to get the first group that license has been around for ten, about 10 years now. So um, we'll, we'll probably start to see more people have had it. Most people haven't had the license or they're just getting to the point where they've had the license for about six years or the registration for about six years now, if they're going to, if that's going to happen. So they're a little bit newer and kind of an outlier at this point. Um, attachment B, we pulled the time to complete supervised experience hours. Um, and so this is sort of, there's a number of different ways we can pull this data and breeze. We um, took a look at the time to and the time from um, when they submitted their experience hours. So basically when they graduated um, until they um, submitted for the clinical. So as you can see from that chart, overall, it's taking about between three and four years. Um, on average for somebody to gain their required hours for licensure. Um, and this is pretty consistent. There's, I, I left in this memo some other research that we did in past years that's not directly comparable because we weren't on breeze at the time we pulled the data, so it was pulled a little bit differently. Or it, but, uh, in terms of the 2008 data, we don't know exactly how it was pulled. So. We can't make sure that we pull it the same way, but all of the, the answer we seem to get every time is it takes about 3 or 3 to 4 years for everybody uh, to gain their hours on average. Um, in talking with our, our, uh, licensing evaluators, who really, um, have a good pulse on who on what the reasons are for somebody needing a subsequent registration number. I've listed several of those in our, in your, your packet, um. Registrant might have stopped um, stopped gaining hours because they were going to raise their family. Uh, they may have had an illness or a family member with an illness. They might not be able to obtain employment or supervision. Um, so various things like that, life circumstances that can cause um, gaining hours to take more time. So somebody needs a subsequent registration number. So with that, that's kind of a, a background. I would recommend that the committee discuss a couple of things today. Number one is the six year limit on the age of experience hours. And then 
Number two would be the with the six year length of the registration number. Um, the inability of a registrant to work in a private practice after that period of time has ended. Um, and I also included in your packet an attachment that kind of shows some law. I pulled some law from other states that kind of indicates how those other states deal with it. I tried to, to kind of pull some bigger states and then a couple of states that are on the West Coast um, nearer to us. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up for discussion. Thank you, Roseanne. Um, Diana, do you have any particular comments or questions you want to start with? I don't think I have specific questions. I do think it's just interesting to look at, you know, what other states do. And I think, you know, one of the topics that we've been looking at a lot as a board, not just in this committee, is kind of reciprocity and what it means to be licensed in another state versus here, what it means, you know, to start in another state and try to get licensed here or vice versa. So I think it is important for us to kind of look at those state differences because I, not that we have to follow what other states are doing, but I think we need to really consider what they're doing um, because that's gonna impact us when we have licensees wanna come to California from one of these other states, so. And now, of course, I flipped on my page and I'm looking for where that document just went. So, <laughs> um, Roseanne, along those lines, it looks like from the examples you've provided, there isn't anybody that provides a longer period of time than six years. Is that correct? Not that I've seen. I'm, of course, this isn't a comprehensive survey of all states. There's not really, I, I wasn't able to find a great chart that showed, you know, this is all of the states and the the exact length of time and sometimes the law raises questions, but, but in general, they, they tend to be limited to a certain number of years. Usually the registration number lasts 5 or 6 or 8 years. And some states even go as far as saying after that. You can't apply, you know, you're done. You're done. You have to apply for a new license. Um, we've kind of discussed that particular piece in the past. Um, one thing with that, with our board being a composite board. Um, if we were to tell people that they need to apply for just straight up apply for a new license after after a six or eight year period of time. Um, we do need to keep in mind that in 2012, we changed our licensing requirements um, for LMFTs and LPCCs. So we changed the degree requirements from 48 to 60 units. Um, and so just be aware that if we were to change, make that change like some other states have with the 48 to the 60 units, that would automatically require certain people with an older degree to get a brand new degree. Um, whereas, and that's for LMFT and LPCC, but no unit because LCSWs have a national accrediting agency, their unit um, didn't necessarily change. And so it would affect the LPCC and LMFTs more adversely um, than the LCSWs if we were to do that. I I don't doesn't seem like that that would be our goal. Um, right. If we're, if we're trying to ensure that uh, there are a sufficient number of licensees to serve the public and. Um, yeah, that's just one thing to keep in mind because we had explored that in the past and that was sort of the question that arrived uh, that came out of that sort of discussion. So. Um, Diana, go ahead. You know, I have a question as well. So. One of the things that I just think about when I look at this, because I, I do work with a lot of students and a lot of associates is, you know, how it is difficult. I know it seems like, oh, six years, that's so long to get your hours, but it can be difficult for those that aren't able to do it full time. And um, it is difficult to find a full time paid position straight out of school that pays you enough to survive. A lot of students end up having to like go back to waitressing to, to help make ends meet, or they have to keep their full-time job while they're getting hours on the side. And to say, well, 10 hours a week should be doable, that can be a hardship also, because that means they need to pay for childcare, they need to take time away from their families. So I do know that there are some people that, that can manage five hours a week, and even that can be difficult on a regular basis. So. I think for us to just keep that in mind when we look at these limits, um, you know, there might be some, and and I, I'm again, I'm not an LCSW, but I do know of a lot of MSWs that go into child welfare and they get a 40 hour a week job and they get benefits and 
they can focus all of their attention on something like that. It's a little bit harder, I think, um, for an MFT or a PC to find that sort of position that gives them 40 hours a week. Uh, so I just think that's worth us considering when we say, should we, you know, limit it to the six years or do they get extra time or can they reapply? All right. Excellent comments. I, I, along those lines, I kind of have 2 questions. 1 should be a quick 1 and, and I think during the pandemic, we had quite a few waivers and quite a few exemptions. Um, did we have a, an exemption on or a, a, an extension on time to accrue hours during the pandemic? Did, we did no, not. we did not. Okay. So that could be something that we um, consider as part of this, you know, if we have. I know in the past, Roseanne, you, you mentioned that there's been some difficulty defining a hardship, but um, a pandemic related hardship might be an easy one um, to scoop up. And I know we've had some public comments at previous board meetings about some of the difficulty in getting hours during the pandemic. So that may be an approach to consider as an interim solution. And then my other question, and as a public member, still relatively new to the board, um, can you remind me a quick overview of the process to get a new registration number? So not start over on the uh, um, on the whole license process to begin with, but if they start a new registration number, do they have to start all over on their experience hours or do some of those carry forward? So the, if they want a subsequent registration number, um, no, they do not need to start all over. What would happen is they would need to pass the California law and ethics exam um, they would submit their fee, an application, a new registration number would be issued. The hours don't expire all at once. They they each hour expires as it becomes six years old. So um, let's say so as somebody's going into their seventh year, if they had hours each of their previous six, the hours from the first year would be starting to expire. Okay, that's helpful. It's helpful to know. Um and it seems like with respect to the overall number of licensees, it's a relatively small group, but, um, and I don't suppose we have a, the ability to kind of differentiate between some of the impacts of the pandemic on, on um, expiring, expiring uh, hours at this point. We, we probably don't track the data separately like that. Okay. Probably not. It, it, you can see, I mean, it, it's, we're just right, you know, coming out of that. It looks like, the, the time to licensure has helped fairly steady last year, but the effects of the pandemic probably won't be known for a couple of years. Okay, um, Diana, do you have any other questions? No, you know, I just, what you said, Roseanne, that just reminds me of talking with some students and educators this week and that there are students and I'm assuming associates also because of the mandate to be vaccinated, to be working in the mental health field, some of them have stepped back from that because either they've chosen to not be vaccinated or it's you know not in their best interest to be vaccinated. And so um, they've had to step back from positions that they had. And you know, while we know that there are some telehealth options, everybody can't work telehealth, and nor does everybody want to work telehealth. And so I think that's worth looking at too as we move forward, especially now. Um, you know, for for the last year, everything was telehealth, and so people kind of jumped into that because all agencies made that switch. But now that things are different, there's a lot of people finding themselves without work because of that. So. That's an excellent point as well. Um, it seems like this might be um, a good time to go for public comment. Because I'm sure that uh, some of our attendees might have some thoughts on this. So, moderator, um, would you open the Q and A panel for public comment, please? Yes, I have opened the. Sorry for the dog. I've opened the public comment section. Click on the Q and A icon at the bottom of the cor bottom right corner of your screen. In the Ask field, type comment. Click send when prompted. Click unmute me button. Or you can click the raise hand icon next to your name. If you're audio only, you can click the raise hand by pressing star three.
I will give it a few moments for people to note. Looks like Jennifer Alley has a comment. I will unmute you one moment. Go ahead, Jennifer. You'll have two minutes. Um, hello again. This is Jennifer Alley with CAMP, the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Um, I, I don't have a specific opinion on the length or time frame for the um, registration. Um, but we do have some concerns about hours being lost, especially for, um, you know, associates that have had life events, um, such as maternity leave, illness, caregiving, or military ex experience. You know, all of those are uh, valid reasons for delay in completing their hours um, and for a need for a subsequent uh, registration number. Um, you know, in comparison for regular employment, right, you get mandatory leave for those and to have those type of life events, not have a leave process under the board, we think could, you know, slow people down and um, securing their, you know, add additional time to their licensing process that could be avoided. Um, but we do hear about, you know, I do understand the, the comments on the from the board regarding the need for relevant experience. But had somebody been working even for a month after they were licensed, if they took time off, there would be no penalty. Um, and so we just would like the board to have some thoughtful discussions about that. Um, and I don't really have an, an opinion about um, the inability of somebody under a subsequent registration number to work in private practice. We are uh, interested in hearing what concerns other stakers may, may have um, about this issue. Um, and so that is all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Ben Caldwell. Ben, I have requested to unmute you and you will have two minutes. Good afternoon, Ben Caldwell, licensed MFT. I want to start by really thanking Roseanne for this report and for the precision of your language around it. I know that because we're talking about uh, two different but related rules that that can often be confusing for students and associates as well as others. Um, and by others, I mean me. So I really appreciate your uh, the precision of language here. Um, my view is very much in line with uh, what Dr. Herwick was was expressing. It's often very difficult for uh, associates to find a position that grants them um, adequate pay and other protections such that they can actually work their way toward licensure quickly. Um, you know, it's it's one thing if somebody's able to get a full time job getting hours that whole time, and it's something quite different if someone for financial or other reasons has to uh, work part time or not at all. I know it's going back a few years now, but uh, Sean O'Connor did that study for his master's thesis, looking at people dropping out of the process on the way to licensure. And if memory serves, he found that something on the order of a third of those who initially register as MFTs or CSWs in California actually never make it to their license exams. And while some of that might be thought of as reasonable attrition, it's a really high number. And I'm sure that some portion of that number are folks who didn't get to licensure, not because they didn't want to and not because they weren't skilled, but because they couldn't afford it. It was simply too expensive of a, of a process for them to make it through. So I think anything that we can do to make it um, a, a more economically viable proposition for people to make their way through the licensure is probably a, a good change. Um, like Miss Alley from Camp, I, I don't have particularly strong opinions seconds. about six years versus seven years versus eight. I wondered if there was appetite for good cause language, like what the Board of Psychology has that was in the report to allow for edge cases. Thank you. Thank you. And our last comment comes from Rebecca Gonzalez. Rebecca, I have requested to unmute you. You'll have two Rebecca, Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter. 
Um, I also want to align my comments with both Jennifer, Allie, and Ben Caldwell. I do see a lot of good reasons why people, you know, pause in gaining their hours, such as being a caregiver, raising a family, but also those economic reasons that Ben outlined, um, you know, having, uh, you know, not being able to uh, have enough hours. They might have another job. Um, obtaining employment where they can gain hours um, can be very difficult. Um, I've also heard from macro social workers who really want to get their license, but their job is as a macro social worker, they're working on policy, so it's hard to find enough time to uh, get their hours otherwise. Um, so I do, you know, also have an interest in some good cause language, um, especially for those, for the issues like being a caregiver and, and those kinds of things, military service, et cetera. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And I see no other comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. I always appreciate the um, comments and feedback from um, our professional association partners. Um, always very helpful for me, particularly as a public member to, to understand those perspectives. And I think there were several helpful comments that, that came out of that. Um, kind of going back to the original issue that Roseanne, you raised in your presentation about the definition, it was always uh, difficult to come up with a definition of hardship. Um, so, I wonder if we could look at what definitions may be used uh, for the board of psychology of what constitutes a good cause. Um, and also kind of thinking during that, perhaps some definitions in FMLA law about what, you know, what sort of things would be covered um, under those. And maybe there's somewhere to start working towards a definition. Um, and I'd also think about including something about pandemic related hardships as well. But um, Dr. Harwick, is, is anything um, additional hearing after hearing the stakeholder comments? Nothing additional. Thanks, Wendy. Um, is this something that we might? Oh, sorry, Roseanne, go ahead. I can actually weigh in a little bit on what psychology board does. So they don't actually have anything in, in law or regs about this, um, about what what is a hardship? They have the ability, they have um, one of their committees, their law allows somebody to basically petition um, for a, a one year extension due to hardship. And so what, what they do is that that um, goes to one of their um, committee, one of their board's committees. Um, they review those in a closed session um, and make a recommendation. And then they are required, right now they're required to take it to the full board um, and then the board makes a, the final decision in public section, session, although the, it kind of the, in public section, because it's dealing with sensitive information that's often medical information, it's mostly redacted. So the board pretty much, my understanding is just ends up going with the recommendation of the committee. Um, they have a law this year that's delegated just their one of their committee to make the decisions in closed session. Um, and so that's how they do it. Um, they get about 10 per meeting, they've said. And so they have about, we have, they have about 25 to 30,000 licensees. We have about 120,000. Um, so we're talking probably some fairly large volumes um, if if that were the direction that, that we were to go. So uh, those are some, some kind of considerations and things to think about on that. Do you, can I ask Roseanne, do you know um, if they, they do that one year, can they then ask for another year or is it one year you're done? There's no additional time. I believe it's one time. Okay. And so I will just say that that's an interesting thing as we look at hardship for something like caregiving, if you become a, a, a dependent child's or dependent adult's caregiver, it could go on kind of indefinitely, right? I mean, we know hospice is supposed to be six months and that could be six years. And so um, for somebody that has to take a step back who may have been working on hours for four years and has a big chunk of hours done and then has to take 
a long break to care for their dying loved one or a disabled loved one to then say, okay, none of those count. I don't know. I, I guess it's something that we'd have to, that I would like us to look at. Um, knowing that, of course, if you haven't practiced for 10 years, that things have changed in 10 years. So if you're coming back at 10 years, there would have to be something put in place to kind of, I don't want to say remediate, because we don't know that they really need remediation, but something to fill the gaps if there's that kind of um, extended period of time. But um, if nothing else, this last year and a half has showed us that things happen. <laughs> and so I think to kind of think ahead would be helpful. Great comments. Um, Roseanne, do you feel like you have kind of enough feedback to start working towards maybe bringing this to the back at the next meeting with some sort of hardship definition to consider, or is there some other uh, consideration we should get before? Um, I'd like Steve to weigh in. I think I I'm not sure. I I, I can research like family family leave law. Um, in terms about more lengthy leaves, but absence, I'm not, I'm not exactly clear what kind of proposal we would want to bring forward. So, Steve, do you want to weigh in on that at all? Um, yeah, I'm thinking other, the other information that we could possibly, you know, do a really full research on what other states do for this and maybe other licensing agencies within California. Um, I think that might be helpful to see that. Um, additionally, I don't know how to do it, but I do also like uh, Ben's uh, Ben's thought of uh, like the dropout rates of uh, of registrants because we want to make sure that you know they can try to make sure and not not want to drop out. We want to keep them moving forward. So, um, but yeah, I think maybe if you had a view of what, you know, current other agencies are doing for that. Um, and then maybe we can look more in depth as to other states and get more information on that to kind of make a super kind of look at that. Additionally, I know it's, it's another looking it down the line, one more meeting, but I think maybe that might be beneficial. Roseanne, I mean, do you think yeah, I think that that and like maybe some of the FMLA law, I, th I think we're going to find that most states pretty much kind of do it the way that the ones that we've seen in the packet do it. That's kind of the majority seem to have a, some sort of a, a limit between 6 and 8 years. It's kind of it kind of centers around when the new occupational analysis is do, done for the exams. Um, and so. Right. And the, the hardship, um, the hardship just to kind of talk to that aspect of it too is, um, I would, if, if for some reason we go uh, to that um, kind of uh, format, um, I would want to um, put that decision into the board's hand um, so that, um, because it's, it's technically, I mean, it's something that I think as a staff level, it's really hard to, you know, make that decision um, as to what counts as a hardship and what does not. Um, and we could talk more about that if we come back and we want to go that route. Um, it's like, um, as you can see with psychology, they get 10 to, you can say 10 to 20 hardship requests every meeting. Um, we have, as much, I don't know what they're, the, I guess the hardship, I don't, they don't really have a dual kind of like step licensure, but um, we have our population of registrants is 30,000. That's how much licensees they have. Um, and just with the anecdotally, how many requests we get or questions we get about, is there any way to extend this time? I can imagine it would be quite a, um, and not necessarily that, it, I mean, it's, it would be quite a workload, not that that should mean anything, um, because it is something that we need to look at and I want to assist people in getting through this process. So, but just kind of a thought on that is, um, it definitely would be something that I would want to put in charge of like a committee of some sort. Um, so as to take that, that, um, you know, make it a little more objective and coming from the board. So. 
Thank you, Steve, on that. Um, I'm sort of reflecting on that comment about um, just even thinking about existing board meetings and backlogs and that sort of thing. Um, I, I wonder about the ability to keep up with that number, that potential number of hardship requests coming before the board and um, gathering folks for that. But, so that is an important thing to consider going forward. Um, what, you know, if we were somehow able to develop a, a pretty tight definition that might be um, more helpful um, and, and instead of leaving it more vague and open-ended. Um, but Rosa, you look like you wanted to jump in. I had a question. Um, rather than going the route of um, a couple of things have changed, you know, with registrations since um, over the past few years, and I'm wondering if, if from a public protection side, um, so we now have a requirement that to get a new registration number, um, somebody needs to pass the California Law and Ethics exam. Um, and we also we have a proposal, which we don't know, you know, it's a bill proposal right now. We don't know if it will go through or not, but that registrants be required to take three hours of California law and ethics every year. So if that were to go through, um, would there be any appetite for maybe allowing possibly an, an extra year um, on the six years since if those things were in place or um, in lieu of that, maybe allowing private practice, you know, removing the prohibition on private practice um, that might open up a little bit more opportunities for somebody rather than going down this route of it, except the concern that I have with exceptions and I don't know what legal would say about this is that it becomes really hard to treat everybody the same. Um, you know, as uh, if staff was doing it as you get different different staff members looking at different things or even different board members over time looking at different things. Um, you know, whether somebody had cancer for one year versus five years, you know, you kind of get into those those decisions and it becomes, I think, really difficult to be equitable. Um, whereas maybe loosening things a little bit for everybody might give a little bit more opportunity or a little bit more wiggle room. I don't know. I don't know if there's an appetite for that um, or not. To speak on that too, um, one of the issues that was brought up uh, I mean, in our past conversations with this and some of the one of the hardships that that people have is if they come to their sixth year and they have good employment at a private practice and they're the private practice is willing to keep them on but we're saying no you can't so i mean that does help out you know possibly thinking about that is uh, you know getting rid of the you know the, the prohibition of the private practice on the subsequent registration that that could be a start to help out and if I could just add to that, I guess, and I wasn't part of the discussion when it was decided that private practices wouldn't be, you know, an okay option after six years. So I'm assuming that maybe that had to do because we were concerned with what kind of supervision they were getting, if there was really oversight. And, and we know that some private practices are great and some aren't. Um, working with a lot of nonprofit and exempt settings, so as an educator, I do know that we have some great supervision and some not so great supervision. I think that what the board has already done by changing some of those supervision regs, right, and that are coming into effect, I think that helps to take care of some of that concern. So I wonder if that work that's already been done in regard to supervision and kind of heightening the supervision expectations, if that would make us feel more comfortable with private practice being an option beyond the six years. I, I think that's a good point. I guess I, I don't have a background either on why that prohibition is in place. So I, I suspect, like Dr. Harwood mentioned, there was a concern about quality of supervision at the time, but, you know, maybe that's not as as much of an issue as it was. Roseanne, sorry. It's kind of one of those things that's just always been in law. I've been told that, that if there's a couple of reasons for it, um, you know, due to the shortage of supervisors, they don't want people taking up a supervisor in private practice forever. Um, we are doing some things to, to make it so there's hopefully more supervisors available. The other thing was the concern that private practices might just 
you know, they're, they're more for profit, smaller organizations. They could just utilize a bunch of in associates as cheap labor with no, you know, it could become like a second layer, layer career. No intention of ever getting a license. I don't know how common that is. I'd be interested to hear kind of the perspective of the associations on that. I don't know if that's a, 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 tr a serious concern or not. Um, Especially if the person was is being required to, you know, pass a, a law and ethics exam, and maybe we put an age on the on the, you know, the an age limit on the law and ethics exam, which isn't something we have right now. That's a possibility, or, um, you know, if if that if that age is or if the law and ethics exam and having those coursework makes us feel any better about that. I'm not sure if it changes the situation. I'd be interested to hear from the public on that. If, is it really a big if we if we you know get rid of that private practice on a subsequent number? Is it really going to open the floodgates for problems? I don't I don't know. Um, I do hear from a lot of people that you know they took a break for for a while. They may have gotten a registration number, worked a couple of years, um, took a break, and then when they come back, you know, seven years later, because seven years have passed, they have to get a subsequent number, so they can't work in a private practice at all. That door is automatically closed for them. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not sure that there's there's much we can do about really, really old hours because we the the hours do need to be somewhat current, but it, you know, it would alleviate that person that, you know, took a five year break, came back, you know, several years later and wanted a subsequent number, but now they can't work in a private practice. So all of these doors are closed. And if I could just say one more thing uh, that I think also there's a lot of private practices that are doing really innovative things and have specialties that our associates couldn't get at a nonprofit at a county agency. And so they would love to go work with these private practitioners that are doing these really neat things. And I think when we've got somebody that is developing that specialty to then say, okay, now we're going to take you away from that. That just makes one less practitioner in the community that can work with that that need. So I think that that's worth really looking at. I, I again, I'd like to hear from the public also to see what others, especially those with private practice experience might bring to the table. So. Okay, sounds like this might be a good time to reopen public comment. Uh, so moderator, would you please open the Q and a panel, please? Yes, I have opened the public comment again. Click on the Q&A icon at the bottom right corner of your screen in the ask field type comment, click send, and when prompted to uh, unmute, you will unmute yourself. Uh, conversely, you can also click on the raise hand icon next to your name, or if you're audio only, you can press star three. I will give a few moments to see if anybody has a comment. Uh, ben Caldwell, I will unmute you one moment. You will have two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Ben Caldwell, MFT. I I want to kind of defer to the knowledge and wisdom of my colleagues here from Campton NASW, California, um, when it comes to the larger kind of association issues. But I do recall that historically speaking, part of the the concern was about the possibility that an intern then associate now uh, could be sort of in private practice forever, uh, constantly getting enough hours to sort of keep them employed there, but not enough to actually get them licensed. Um, and just philosophically, I wonder if, if as long as they're getting you know, relevant, good supervision in accordance with legal requirements, you know, if, if they're happy with that arrangement, should the BBS be forcing their hand to move them ahead to licensure? Um, I, I have sort of conflicted thoughts on the topic, but it's it's interesting to think about from that larger um, larger place because if the supervision is good and legal and the employee is being paid and doing work that they care about, is that in some way a public protection problem? Um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question, but it's it's a question worth considering. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we have a comment from Rebecca Gonzalez. Uh, one moment. Hey, Rebecca, I have requested to unmute you. You will have two minutes. Rebecca Gonzalez, NASW California. As far as the question of whether or not we've heard it's a problem in private practices, just kind of using um, associates for cheap labor, we have not heard that. I mean, I, I we didn't really have a, posi a position on this question just because we had not um, heard any direction from our membership. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Jennifer Alley and I have requested to unmute you, Jennifer. Go ahead. You'll have two minutes. Um, hello, this is Jennifer Alley with Camped again. Um, we don't have a uh, a formal position on the, the private practice and for associates with the subsequent registration number. Um, and I, I appreciate the thoughtful discussion about, you know, hours and how, um, you know, when they should start falling off or aging, um, you know, aside from, you know, the employment challenges with associates and, you know, the limitation on private practice for certain individuals. Um, I do think that the loss of hours for people who have had, you know, a life event um, is real. Right, and it's almost like a penalty, and you know that is our our biggest concern. And and I get that it's really complicated, and I do hope that we can have some discussions down the line about how that can be broached. Thank you. And I see no other hands or comments. Would you like me to close the panel? Yes, please. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, seems like we still have a lot to think about on this one. <laughs> um, Dr. Herwick, do you have any additional thoughts hearing some of the feedback? No, no I don't think I have anything else right now. Uh, Ben's question just about. Um, you know, is it okay to just kind of be an associate indefinitely? I guess that's worth thinking about, right? Why, why, why is there an expectation or why is there a requirement to get licensed? Um, you know, I, I don't think I ever talk with students that want to pursue associateship and don't plan on getting licensed. It seems like that's the path, but does it, does it have to be the path? You know, there are other states that have that the two levels of license and they call the associate what we call associates. They do call a license. And so there's 1 level that you could work. Like this, and you could work under somebody and then there's another level where you can work alone. And so I don't know is that. That's bigger than what we're doing now, but is, is there really a need. To get licensed? I. I guess I I was just raised in the MFT field to think there was, you know, but it is a different way to think about it. So, yeah, it yeah. Worth thinking about. It seems like, um, if if that were if we you know at some point in the future if we were going to think about that that would make sense to me to make that a separate category rat and and have the associates remain as the education and supervision part working towards license and then if we were going to have a group that just wanted to work under supervision it seems like we would create like a separate bucket for them but definitely seems like that's beyond what we're thinking today um so at some point we should probably think about giving Roseanne some direction for coming back <laughs> Um, uh, I'm, I'm really on the fence. Of, I, I still think there are probably some, it's probably worth some additional discussion on. Can we get to a definition of a hardship? Um, and then maybe we also kind of keep, um, 
as part of one of the options to consider um, at our next meeting is this pro removing one of these options about removing the prohibition on private practice, like evaluating whether or not that's helpful, like for the people that are not that are not hitting the six year mark, what, what is, you know, is, is that particular thing a huge impact towards that? And I guess I don't have a great understanding of whether or not removing that would really get us any, any further down the road. And then also whether extending it from six to seven years, um, does that get us further down the road or are they, are there some kind of bigger issues like on the hardship and that, that maybe we need to consider? So, I mean, is it, I know I'm not articulating this very well, but is it is it possible to kind of keep those three options moving forward of extending it by one year, um, looking at the prohibition on private practice, and then also looking at a definition of hardship? Um, Dr. Herwick, I'd be interested in your thoughts on a, how we want to move forward on this as well. Yeah, and I know you're you're new to the chair, and this is only I think my second meeting on the committee, so it's like yay, we're the blind leading the blinder, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think that those are all 3 things that we need to look at. And I guess along with that, if you're saying extending set to 7 years. Then do we still look at then are we allowed to renew after those 7 years? Are we you know, allowed to then go another 7 years? So is that then saying now instead of 12 years, you now have 14 years to get licensed. You know, I, and I think that just opens up more, but I think. For me, the hardship is really important because I think we do need to figure out what that means and a hardship for one person just because it's not, it wouldn't be a hardship for me doesn't mean it's not a hardship for somebody else. Right? So we need to make sure that we keep those things in mind, even, you know, as we looked at, you know, the hardships of telehealth and, and those sorts of things. So I think. That we all need to kind of come to that table with open eyes and. And create a definition ourselves, really, right? I mean, a financial hardship for one person might not be a problem for somebody else. It could be a catastrophe for somebody, right? And so, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I guess that that would be the most important thing to me to figure out under what parameters can somebody have a longer amount of time? Or, or like you said, or do we just give a longer time for everybody? But I, I don't know that going to seven years fixes the hardship issue. Okay, should we put that in a motion then? Or Roseanne, do you, do you need more clarification from us? I think, so what I'm hearing from you is, is that you would like to see maybe or some research on some definitions that are already in law of hardships, like maybe looking at FMLA or um, some other language somewhere to kind of see if, if there's any examples out there. Um, so we can bring back some research on that um, to see if, see what kind of parameters we can find. And then also possibly um, a little bit more discussion about removing the prohibition on private practice um, and, and possibly going from six to seven years, maybe some, you know, what that language would, would look like. Um, is what I'm hearing. So I, I'm mainly hearing that we kind of want to explore like the definition of a hardship and what's out there in terms of of language. Um, the the actual law change like from from six to seven years. Like I don't know that there's much we can like really research that. Like right. what kind of findings we would find um, removing the prohibition on private practice. I think we could have it more as a as a continued discussion item. Um, but I, I'm really hearing that you kind of want more like. Examples of like how law in other places might define a hardship. Yeah, I think so. And and I will. I'm sorry. One other thing, and I I don't know who Sean O'Connor is, who wrote his master's thesis, and I don't know how long ago he wrote it, but I'm curious what that was and what the findings were. And so I think I'll do a quick look, and um, maybe Ben has that information that he could share sometime. Um, we because have I am that. curious to see what that is. We yeah, we have that, and it was done, okay. I think, in 2008, I think. Uh, yeah, so I can provide that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that I think that would be helpful because that's not captured in the time to licensure data. For people that just drop out altogether, we're not considering that when we're looking at time to licensure.
Okay. Um, with that, then should we, I guess I'll make a motion to further explore uh, the definition of hardship and uh, keep um, the prohibition on private practice and one year extension as, as uh, options uh, for discussion going forward. Does, does that sound like a motion that makes any sense? <laughs> the motion would be to direct staff to research the following bullet points that you laid out. Thank you, Christina. So what Christina said. <laughs> I, will, I will second that. Uh, thank you. Um, since we have a motion now, uh, I think we need to go back for public comment with the motion. So moderator, can you open the Q and A panel? Yes, I have opened the Q and A panel. If anybody would like to make a comment, please click on the Q and A icon, the bottom right corner of your screen. In the ask field, type comment and click send when prompted. Click unmute. Unmute yourself if you would like to raise your hand. Icon the icon is next to your name, and if you are on audio only, those participants can hit star three. I will give it a few moments. Ben does not need to comment, but could the motion please be repeated? Can you repeat the um, the motion, please? Sure. Um, so we are going to direct staff to um, further um, do research on uh, other how other agencies and entities may handle a definition of hardship, and we're also going to keep um, the possibility of removing the prohibition on private practice and the one year extension um, as part of the possible um, items to consider going forward. And seeing no other comments or hands raised, would you like me? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, Ben said thank you. Would you like me to close the Q and A? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, okay, and um, with that, Christina, if you could take the roll call vote. Okay, Wendy Strack. Yes. Diana Herwick. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, um, everybody, for the really thoughtful uh, discussion on a complicated topic. And thank you, Roseanne, for keeping us on track. Um, next on the agenda is a public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, as a reminder, the board may not discuss or take action on any matters raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the item uh, on an agenda of a future meeting. Um, we'll go ahead and moderator if you want to open up the Q and a panel for public comment. Yes, I have again opened the public comment option, the Q and a option. If you would like to make a comment. Please type comment in the Q and a box and click. Send when prompted, click the unmute me button. And again, if you would like, you can raise your hand, the hand icon next to your name, or if you're on audio only, press star three. Ben Caldwell, oh wait, Kimberly Beasley has a comment. One moment, Kimberly. I'll let I mute you. I have sent a request to unmute you, Kimberly. You have two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I am really new to California. I'm a military spouse, um, just moved here in July. And one of the issues I've had moving forward is prior to coming, trying to be proactive, um, looking for employment, I was waiting for uh, the board in Virginia to approve licensure. So as of now, I'm a fully licensed um, LPC in the state of Virginia. Prior to getting all of that, I applied for LPCC, um, I guess the associate LPCC, thinking I could kind of be proactive once my license came through, then try to do the whole reciprocity piece. 
upon doing that, now I've kind of been penalized because they said I should have waited till I had my license. Um, and now the associate registration that I have will not be redacted for a year. Um, so I can't apply for reciprocity is what I'm being told, which is then hindering me with employment and being able to bill and trying to kind of go that route. Um, as a spouse with, like I said, I'm fully licensed in another state and just because I didn't, I applied, I guess, prematurely without having my full license. So that's kind of the issue I've run into. I've gone up to the actual um, office in Sacramento, kind of trying to fight this issue so that I could actually like work and be productive. And I'm kind of being penalized for being proactive upon moving here. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there to see, I'm being told that it can't be withdrawn, that the previous application can't be withdrawn for a year. Kim, Kimberly, I will yeah. send you Steve's email and he, you can email him directly. Okay. That would be fantastic. Any help would be amazing. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Uh huh. And we have Ben Caldwell would like to make a comment. Ben, I have requested to unmute you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Ben Caldwell MFT. Um, I think it would be within the purview of this committee. Uh, to take a look at interstate compacts and related measures that other states are doing to try to improve uh, portability and, and streamline that process. Um, I don't know where AMFTRB is on the issue, but I know that uh, the ACA has been working pretty diligently on expanding their interstate compact. Um, and I think that social workers are also making good headway uh, in that area. So just a discussion about that, including potential legislation that the uh, the board may want to pursue to become part of those compacts would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Jennifer Alley. I have requested to unmute you. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon. This is Jennifer Alley again with CAMP. And I just wanted to restate officially restate my comments about having discussions about life coaches and uh, professional corporations, utilization of them and any um, guardrails that may need to be in place. And I um, echo the comments made by Mr. Caldwell um, about uh, interstate compacts. Thank you. Thank you. And Bella has a question. Bella, would you like me to unmute you and you can ask that question to the board? Center request. If not, I can go ahead and ask it. She says, hello, can someone please explain if the prohibition against working in a private practice is for all associates earning hours towards licensure or for associates who have extended the six year time limit? Thank you. Um, the prohibition on private practice is only for subsequent registration numbers. So with a first registration number valid for six years, you can work in a private practice if you're an associate. Um, after that, when you're on a subsequent, then you cannot. Okay, and I have no other comments or hands raised. Would you like me to close the Q&A? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, next um, item on the agenda is suggestions for future agenda items. Do any uh, board members have any additional uh, agenda items for future board meetings? Okay. Um, and then do we need to do public comment again on this one? Okay. We'll open uh, the Q and A panel for public comment on this item as well. Uh, okay, just a moment. Okay, I have opened the public comment section again. If you have, if you would like to ask question or, or if you have a comment, please type comment 
and click send when prompted, you can unmute yourself. Again, you can also raise your hand or if you're on audio only, press star three. I'll give it a few moments. Jennifer Alley, a comment. I have requested to unmute yourself. Jennifer, go ahead. This is Jennifer Alley again with Camp. I'm feeling quite naggy. Maybe this is the actual appropriate place for me to ask you to please put um, life coaches on the licensing committee agenda. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. And I see no other hands or comments. Would you like me to close the panel? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right. And so before we leave uh, this item, um, and I, I know, uh, see, you mentioned before that life coaches will be coming in some shape or form, some discussion of that is likely to be coming some point in the future. So um, just wanted to reassure our partners that this is on the, um, this is on the radar. Um, hopefully we'll have an update then soon about, about when that might come forward as well. Okay. Um, and then I think everybody's favorite agenda item is next, which is adjournment. Um, <laughs> thank you everyone for participating today. Um, the, I have in my notes that the next board meeting is November 4th and 5th, which has already occurred. So, Steve, can I bug you for the date of this <laughs> board so, meeting? <laughs> sorry, there, I forgot to update that script. Uh, February 10th and 11th, I think, is our next meeting. Okay. Um, so, next year. So, happy holidays, everyone. Happy uh, holidays. Yes, 10th and 11th, okay. February. Happy holidays to everyone, and uh, we'll see everybody in February. Thank you so much, and we're adjourned.